Did you know that Josephine Baker was a spy? While she's best known for being a singer and a dancer, during World War II, she worked as a spy for the French Resistance. And today, we're going to talk about it. And if you have your own questions, you can reach out to me at onemikehistory.com in the contacts page. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so. I'm Buy Me Coffee on my Patreon page in the description below. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. In 1939, as Europe was on the brink of war, the French military intelligence service under the leadership of Jacques Abney sought to recruit spies to collect information on Nazi Germany and the other Axis powers. Typically, the service chief sought out men who could travel incognito, but this time he asked for the support of an unexpected American-born singer and dancer by the name of Josephine Baker, operating under the code name Shield Rose. Josephine was born into poverty in St. Louis, Missouri in 1906, experiencing the effects of Jim Crow discrimination her entire life. At only 13 years old, she was married and received very little formal education and lived in deplorable conditions with her family. Her fortunes drastically changed at 19 when she was offered an invitation to join the All Black Review, which would be performing in Paris. After arriving in Paris, her and her fellow performers found that it was unlike the United States. France did not have laws segregating public spaces, and when Baker donned her first costume, a bikini covered in flamingo feathers, yet France embraced her exotic dancing and she rose quickly to stardom, becoming one of the most successful entertainers in France, taking on roles in films and operas, and some believe even becoming the wealthiest black woman in the world at the time. So by 1939, she seemed like an unlikely candidate to be a spy because she could never travel in clandestinely. But this is exactly what made her such an enticing prospect. Fame would be her cover. Abney hoped that Baker could use her charm, her beauty, and her stardom to seduce the secrets from the lips of fawning diplomats at embassy parties. Well, Baker would agree to the espionage work for her newly adopted country because she found freedom in France that America only promised her in words. She would state that France has given me all that I have and I'm forever thankful. Therefore, I'm prepared to give my life as a gesture of gratitude. Please make use of me in any way you see fit. Beginning her undercover work attending diplomatic functions held at Italian and Japanese embassies, despite the risk involved, the novice spy bravely recorded her conversations that occurred at these events by taking notes on her palm and even up her arm. She would take to pinning notes to her underwear, knowing that she would never face a strip search, and she was right. But still, Abby told her she needed to be cautious. She would respond by saying, nobody would think I was spy. She was confident in her celebrity and her connections protecting her. In the aftermath of the German invasion of France, Josephine continued to perform in the capital city. Baker would provide comfort to those displaced in homeless shelters and serenade soldiers fighting on the front lines with her songs. By June of 1940, enemy forces had closed in on the city and Abney urged Josephine to vacate. So she packed up her belongings that included a gold piano and a bed previously owned by Marie Antoinette, put it in a cargo van and journeyed for a chateau about 300 miles away from Paris. At the chateau, Josephine continued to offer her home to the resistance fighters and provided them with visas. She also continued to attend parties and diplomatic functions, particularly at the Italian embassy, which made her come in contact with some high ranking access bureaucrats. At these events, she collected intelligence on German military forces and noted down harbors and airfields that were still in use. The Nazis became alerted to a possible resistance activities at Josephine's chateau, so they went to investigate. Josephine was concealing a few resistance fighters at the time, but managed to charm away the Nazis. But this prompted her to decide that she should depart France. Consequently, in November 1940, Josephine and Abney worked together to clandestinely smuggle important documents to the free French government that was in exile in London. To obscure her intentions, Abney and Baker pretended to be embarking on a South American tour. Baker made use of her broad social appeal by hiding secret documents under her dress and carrying a sheet of music that contained coded information about German truth movements. While Baker was the focus of attention by German officials, Abney was able to travel in the shadows as the couple made their way from, from France to Spain and ultimately to neutral Portugal. While in Spain and Portugal, Baker continued to attend embassy events and gather information on Axis troop movements. She discreetly jotted down the details in the restrooms and kept her notes fastened to a bra with a safety pin. Subsequently writing about this in her memoir, she claimed in her note that she was ever found out it would be extremely incriminating, but also noted that no one attempted to search her and most individuals just wanted an autograph instead. 
In January of 1941, Baker and Abney sailed to Morocco across the Mediterranean Sea with 28 pieces of luggage and a collection of pet monkeys, mice, and a Great Dane. The ostentatiousness of the journey was a disguise for the true purpose, which was to establish liaison and a transmission in Casablanca. While in Northern Africa, she provided passports to Jewish people escaping Nazi rule in Eastern Europe. However, in 1941, she fell ill with peritonitis and had to be hospitalized. During her 18-month stay, she underwent several operations and was so ill that the Chicago Defender erroneously published her obituary. Written by Langston Hughes, suggesting that her death was due to Nazi persecution, Baker was able to quickly set the record straight, informing the Chicago Defender that there's been a slight error, but I'm much too busy to die. While healing, Baker remained an active part in the war effort. In addition to hosting meetings at her bedside, she kept an eye on the American and French resistance activities outside her door, observing the influx of American forces as they arrived in Morocco for Operation Torch in November of 1942. After being discharged, she toured Allied military camps, and by day she rode in jeeps in the scorching deserts of North Africa, and by night she bundled up and slept on the ground next to her vehicle to avoid landmines. After four years of Nazi occupation, the city of Paris was liberated in October of 1944. The liberation was celebrated in the streets with joy and flowers. Riding back to France, Josephine was celebrated in her lieutenant's uniform. She would don her uniform again in 1961 after receiving two of France's highest military honors, the Cure de Guerre and the Legion of Honor, all at a ceremony which detailed all of her espionage work to the world. Tearful Baker told her countrymen that I am proud to be French because this is the only place in the world where I could realize my dream. Thank you. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this has been One Mike History. And if you have questions or you just want to leave your comments, like I said, you can do so at onemikehistory.com in the contact page. Thank you for listening and peace.